Welcome to the Word Podcast. The Lord God has given us His Word. Let us learn it. Let us live it. Let us rejoice in it. Spread the Word. Blessings, everybody. This is Dale. Thank you so much for joining with me again today on the Word Podcast. We're looking at 1 Chronicles 16, looking at how the children of Israel will worship. And remember, David had set up these worship teams. And they were worshiping before the Ark of the Covenant, and they were giving praise to God. And they're actually recounting what the Lord had done. And so in the last episode, we saw in First Chronicles 16, verse 14, that he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Remember this? And that remember his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. Remember, God is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. And then uh, they speak particularly of one covenant, the covenant that he made with Abraham and the oath that he made to Isaac and the confirmation of that covenant that he made through Jacob and that it became a statue to Israel for an everlasting covenant. The Lord said, I will never, ever forsake you. I will never abandon you. So people will say, well, does the Lord still have a plan for Israel and for the Jewish people? Yes, the scripture is quite clear on that. I know a lot of times people say, well, when they rejected Messiah, that was it, and the Lord's not dealing with them anymore. That is not what the scripture says. And there's a lot of well-intentioned people and good people and saved people, et cetera, et cetera, that believe that and say that, but that is not what the scripture says. They really truly want to exalt the church above what the word of God says. And so we saw that in this covenant, part of the covenant that he made with Abraham, there was a a land covenant there, that they would be given the land of Canaan. And that really applies to today. So that's the reason you have all the stuff that's going on in the Middle East, because Israel knows that certain land is theirs. And they still don't have all the land. They have never had all the land. So let's pick it up in verse uh, 19 of First Chronicles 16. It's describing this portion of the inheritance. inheritance. And he says that uh, God made this covenant with them when they were only a few in number very few and strangers in it. In other words, when they were in the land upon the land and they were very few, God gave them this land. Verse 20, and they wandered about from nation to nation and from one kingdom to another people. Verse 21, he permitted no man to oppress them and he reproved kings for their sakes saying, do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no Harm, And you see instances of that in the, in the Old Testament when they were going from a place to place when they were traveling, that the nations would come out and the nations are Gentile nations, that they would come out against them and they would plan on trying to do harm to them. And the Lord would say, uh, no, 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 don't touch them. Don't touch my anointed ones. Don't do these prophets any harm in any way. So verse 23, we go from uh, sort of recounting this to a declaration of what we're supposed to do again. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Folks, we are called to do that. We're called to proclaim what the Lord has done, the good tidings, the gospel of his salvation. Here from First Chronicles' perspective is how he had rescued them out of Egypt and all that he had done in the time of uh, them being in the wilderness, in the time of conquering the land. For us, it is what he has done in bringing forth Messiah. We are to proclaim these good tidings from day to day. We're to sing to the Lord. And he says, all the earth, that's all the creation. Verse 24 says, Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the people. You know, there's just not enough telling of the glory of the Lord, particularly among the nations. We're actually cold hearted when it comes to that. And some, I mean, just in the most simple ways, we're not talking about getting a nine pound study Bible and thumping somebody over the head with it. What we're talking about is just looking at the wonder of things, looking at the wonder of creation and say, look at that. Do you see the hand of God in this? Do you see creation? Do you see what's happening? Do you see it? Do you, and here's the one that, that I use all the time, what it says in Romans 1. Okay, in Romans 1, because in Romans 1, there's two uh, declarations that all men are aware of. There's the external declaration that there is a God that they see in creation. Okay, creation declares the glory and the wonder of the Lord. And then there is the internal testimony. The Lord is placed within every human being 
yet there's an awareness of God. And so we are to tell of this glory among the nations and point that out. Even if somebody's yelling and screaming and they're belligerent and they're hateful and they're threatening and all that kind of stuff, you can still look at them and say, the Lord loves you and you know that he's real because inside you, it tells you that. And boy, that usually rattles folks because it's the truth. Now, verse 25, he says this, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He also is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. The Lord is to be exalted above all creation. He's to be exalted above all gods. <laughs> That's an interesting word right there when you start getting into it. When you look at uh, other portions of Scripture like Psalm 82 and some other things, you find out that the Lord has a counsel before him. The Lord uses a counsel. Okay? He doesn't need a counsel. He doesn't have to have a counsel. But he uses a counsel, and he gets input, and he uses his counsel to go out and expedite various things that he wants done. And so uh, they are referred to in the same term, Elohim, as God is. There is a heavenly counsel. So you have that heavenly counsel, but then you have the gods of the people. Here it says the gods of the people are idols. And the Lord is greater than all of them. He's greater than his heavenly counsel. He's greater than the angels that are with him. He's greater than the angels that have rebelled against him. He's greater than the gods of the people, which are idols. The, why? He says, because the Lord made the heavens. Verse 27, splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. And so this is the thing that they... The, that they declared before the Lord, saying, Lord, we know these things and we rejoice in you because of this, that all splendor, that all majesty are before you, that strength and joy are in you or in your place. And so uh, in verse 28, he comes out and he starts uh, using a little idea that he carries through for a couple of verses. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Verse 29, ascribe to the Lord the glory do his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in holy array. And so you see this mighty declaration of calling forth the people and saying, you know, give credit to God, all everybody, all the people. Give glory to God. Give the strength to God. It is he that has done all this. It's he that does everything in our lives. Why would we dare worship anything else? Why would we give greater glory, greater attention, greater time to anything else other than the Most High God? It's really a question for us to consider today. Anyway, we'll pick this up the next time. I'm Dale. I'll see you then. <music>